Welcome to Mindset Mastery with your host, George Reister. Today, I have the most interesting guest that I ever had on the show. Her name is Rosalind Withers. She is the daughter of Ernest Withers. He was the official photographer for the NAACP, Martin Luther King, you name it. And he was the official photographer for the civil rights movement. So you can imagine this is gonna be a show full of educational information and it's gonna bless you tremendously when you see what she has in her possession, how they're giving it out to the community for everyone to see and be a part of a history that to a certain degree has been locked away. He has over 1.8 million photos. One. Point eight. His photos are in the museum in Was the Historical Museum in Washington, D.C., the National Museum of uh, African Americans in Memphis, Tennessee, as well as in her own, her own location, with the, which is in Memphis, Tennessee, called the Withers Collection. So you don't want to miss this episode. Trust me, you'll be blessed. The information that you find out, you'll be able to share and we'll see you in just a few moments. Hello again, this is George Reister, your Mindset Mastery Coach. Today, we I have a guest that I've been wanting to get on this show since the show started. And I finally just asked, and guess what? She said yes. Absolutely. Her name is Rosalind Withers. She is the director and conservator to the Withers Collection Museum and Gallery. and. This is such an important gallery. This is such an important conversation. I want her to share what's on her heart, some background about the, the museum and the gallery and how it all got started. And I'm gonna throw it to you, Roz, because I, I just want the public to know the value right. <laughs> of, of, of what you have in your hands and how mm -hmm. it all started. So can you tell me, let's talk about your father first. Let's talk about Ernest. And then I'll let you go from there. Okay. Well, my father is Dr. Ernest C. Withers, photojournalist. And he is a legacy beyond legacies because he left the history of not just um, African-American, but he left, um, he left American history in, in our hands. And it's an archive of over one 0.8 million images. And I know when you say that, people go, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, it's 60 years of history. His work starts as early as the 40s, and it comes all the way up until his death in 2007. And what he covered in his journey as a photojournalist is amazing. He was in a lot of places where history was being made Things that were happening were uh, things that even affect us today. And he was taking those images for journalists or publications in the AP wire service to be able to share what was going on in the news and in the media across the globe. Mm -hmm. And his connection was just that across the globe. Now, us having 1.8 million images, we were blessed to be able to uh, get a, a location that is just phenomenal. And I say a location, it is the location on Bill Street. So I'm excited about that. Now, it, is, it was his last studio. And the address, and I want to say this to everybody, because I want in, to all of your audience, no matter where you are, to come to Memphis, Tennessee and come visit us at 333 Bill Street. Why are you gonna always remember that? Is because we have the history of the three kings. We have the history of B.B. King. We have the king of rock and roll, Elvis, and we have Martin King. So we have the three kings and the history of those kings are on our wall. It, the address, as I mentioned, is 333 Bill. So all of your audience, please come visit us in Memphis, Tennessee. That's the first thing. I'm giving you a personal invitation. And what <laughs> you'll see there is very exciting too, because in that 60 years of history, we cover so much 
we covered the his earliest work that he was recognized for is um, the Emmett Till trial. And that's the, the case that really got Martin Luther King's attention because in him covering that case, he was able to provide some images and those images hit the wire service. And that's the reason why we know of the Emmett Till trial case today. And it was so moving when he was able to publish in through the AP wire service, the brutally beaten face of Emmett Till. And it is still impacted to this day. People that I remember that it impacted were people like Muhammad Ali. When he saw that brutally beaten face of Emmett Till, it made him decide not to, to fight in, in the army, in the war, because he felt that if they're killing us here, why am I going over there to fight? So it impacted many. And, and being able to really put that out in the wire service, mm -hmm. what was exciting about it was that it connected a dot for us historically, because Martin wanted to know who did that? How did that happen? And that's what's very interesting about that relationship was because he knew that by putting and publishing that information, it was a form of really protection. And it made people aware that these injustices take, took place. And even today, we're aware of the injustices taking place because we're visually able to see it immediately. How? Through our phones. That visual impact is so important. And it really does change the course of history when we know that these things are occurring. And, and many things can occur when, when you are in knowledge of what's going on. Wow. And um, Martin was able to then ask him, did you, first, did you do that? And how were you able to do that? And he explained yeah. that he was a journalist. And he says, well, can you do it again? And in him asking him, can you do it again? He asked him to meet him at the Montgomery bus boycott. And that's why we have record of Martin sitting on that bus because he wanted that to be published as well. So that's a, that was really a historic moment. Very and historic. It, yes, and included um, the events that led to even uh, Rosa Parks and all the other courageous, courageous steps that were being taken during that time because those stories hit the papers, the wire service, and we were able to see visually what was happening and wow. ready to take a stand because we were able to see that. Wow, Roz, when, I, I mean, you just mentioned some very <laughs> deep photos and, and, and images that still strike America today. Yeah. When you first, found out those images existed. What was your thought process? How did you in body take all of, this, all of this in? Because having those photos brings a responsibility. Oh, it's huge. Well, honestly, my father did a self-published book and it was in 1955. And he wrote in that last pre paragraph in the preface that he said that he wanted to publish this book because he wanted to make sure that he didn't want to stir up racial animosity, but he wanted it to be properly recorded that this incident that occurred with the injustice of the verdict that took place in Emmett Till's trial, that we learned from that. And his words were that it need not occur again. And and then he went on to say that this book was not sponsored by any organization, any group, but an individual project by Ernest C. Withers. So when I read that, it, what it does for me, it puts my responsibility in perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, my father was born in 1922 and he passed away in 2007, which meant that he was 85. 
But that book was published in 1955. Wow. So he was a young man, yeah. which also lets us know that at that young age, he knew what he was doing and that he was responsible for recording history. And that's one of the reasons why Martin and, and Andrew Young, which I've had many conversations with, and he warms my heart every time I talk to him mm -hmm. about, you know, the impact that my father had on them really being protected because it's the stories that hit the press that allowed them to be protected. Mm -hmm. And when he was able to publish that, it gave them more courage because now people are aware of the injustice and they knew that they had to keep moving and keep going, making those courageous decisions to try to correct what was, you know, so unjust. Yes. Oh my goodness. You know, I've met your father. Yes, I've you been did. to your been to your father's home. Many meals at the table. <laughs> Many meals at the table. And at the time, I had no clue who he was because he was so down to earth, so warm, so loving, so friendly. Invite anybody into the house to, to come and he, he and your mother to, yeah. to come celebrate the meal, hang out in the yard, play games, whatever. They were so giving. I had no clue to his identity. Right. And so for you growing up, how did, what was your childhood like? in discovering that or, or did you were you in the same situation as I was I was definitely in the same situation and I say that because I I really didn't view the it was he was my father you know and it was you know and my mother was the one that keep kept us all straight you know she brought things to reality and she did it to him too as well as to all of us yes but um he one thing that we knew that he loved and was very passionate about was his camera and if he set that camera down it wasn't very far even when he sit down to have a meal that camera was right there on the sure table was. Yes. so he was always ready to aim and shoot no matter what mm -hmm. but was it important at that time I can't say that I even knew that I, I can tell you that I didn't know that mm -hmm. um I'm going to tell you when I really realized the importance of it is when I walked, I, my father passed away and I walked into the, it wasn't the archive, it was the studio. And this was the studio where all of his files were. And, and I mean, it was cabinets and cabinets and cabinets of files. And, you know, it just looked like a junk house because it was just so much material and, yes. and, but one thing that I did is that I opened up a couple of the drawers. And when I opened up the drawers, I would find myself in that drawer for hours, you know, and I couldn't leave. And I was like, you know, if, if I'm drawn in with this and the people that we would find in those drawers were people that we, we knew of, you know, like the Count Basies and, I mean, people from every, one thing that, that really struck me is that I had the, um, the president, he's the CEO of St. Jude Hospital. His name is uh, Rick Shadiak. He was the best, his father was uh, Danny Thomas's best friend. Okay. And then I had Tom Shadiak, his brother, and you know Tom because Tom, uh did many movies i mean he was he did all of uh jim carrey's movies you know yes. liar liar yeah. all of all of them everyone okay. that he did tom shadiak was the director of them well tom and and tom was looking at uh, some property in memphis he had an interest of, of okay really kind of playing it forward and they came into the museum i mean they came into the museum and then i invited them to the archive so we walked into the archive i opened the drawer and i just opened this j drawer because you know it was uh, i mean uh, s drawer it was saint jude so i opened it up and then we found this envelope that says saint jude mm -hmm. so i pull out the envelope 
And I look at it, it says St. Jude, it says February 2nd, 1962. So I open it, pull it out and we were, we picked it up and we put it against the light so you could see the imagery. Cause now they're excited because they're looking for their daddy, right? Ah, uh, yes. So we're going through trying to find their daddy. And, and then Rick says, you know, this looks like um, the opening of the hospital. And I said, really? I said, okay. You see St. Jude? I said, what's the date? He said, well, it opened in February 2nd, 1962. I said, well, that's what's on the envelope. <laughs> oh, wow. We were like living. It was like, really? So we went through that whole thing. And we, as a result, we pulled out all those images and we, we actually uh, digitized that envelope. And we put together a portfolio for St. Jude as a result. And most of the images in there, they had never seen either. So it was just incredible. Incredible. Wow. Those are the kind of stories that we have almost every day. Well, I, I want to say this because I want to put this out front. While we early in our conversation, when we get to the middle of, we get to the end, I'm still going to put this out front because of the importance of what you have in your hands and what you're trying to get to the community and to the world to understand what your father did and how valuable those images are and how they can help us relate mm -hmm. to our past history. So Ross, I want you to tell us how people can donate to the museum because I mean, here's my thing, guys. We always talk about we want to help. We want to we want to know more about our history. We we want to know, you know, where our place was, so we'll know where we where we're going, and 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 so we don't repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again. Well, here's an opportunity for us to demonstrate how important our history is because of the museum in itself, whether mm -hmm. it's traveling around from city to city internationally or you know what the, whatever the case may be because we're going to talk about some other things too you know where the photos are now in washington we, we're going to talk about it but first i want to give everybody a chance to financially contribute to keep this going and for you to be able to get all of those images that you have digitized in a way so they'll be stored forever that they'll never be lost Absolutely. Well, thank you. You know, you bring tears to my eyes because it is uh, a, a journey. It's, it's a very difficult task to be able to digitize. And I was explaining to you earlier that it cost about $7.50 per image to take it from negative all the way to storing it. So that's taking it and preserving it. So not only are we digitizing it, we take it a step further to preserve it. And we, we do that mainly because we want to be able to, whatever the media changes to, we will have the original authentic uh, media that is available. You know, it's kind of like if you look at the eight track tape, right? Mm -hmm. you, I give you the eight track tape. I said, George, go play this. You go like, what is this? Exactly. <laughs> well, same thing. We are really working feverishly to digitize, but in the next five, 10 years, that may not be the process. And we, so we always have to have the original. And so our digitalization process is kind of costly and we do need the support of everyone to preserve this history. Mm -hmm. This week was a major week for us in terms of our partnership, but we still have to do the digitalization and it's, and it's a major part, it's an expensive part because if you take $7.50 and you multiply it times 1.8 million images, that's the cost. And that's over $13.5 million. Now, of course, people run away when you say that, but it just lets you know that it's a long process to be able to do that. Now, our commitment is when people purchase, we take half, a minimum of half of that to go directly to the digitalization, not to the operation, but the digitalization so that we can continue to digitize. Now we've only digitized 1% of his work. Wow. And we have so much more to go. Now, what is exciting this week is that we have formed an agreement with the largest education instrument that has been used in education throughout all of our days. Wow. Okay. And that is Encyclopedia Botanica. Yes. Which means that our our history will be used for education 
so that our children will have visual content to know what our history is. And yes, we do need that financial support. How can they do that? Yes. They can go to our website. We made it so easy. When you go to our website, there's one button that says donate and that donate goes directly to our digitalization. So please go to the witherscollection.com and you will be able to assist us in, in helping us to digitize. Wow, that's awesome. And let me make sure we got, this is clear. She didn't ask me to ask anybody to donate to the museum. She simply came on a show just out of the kindness of her heart and her willingness to spread and share what her father has done and what he's created for us as, as, in, as a hum, in humanity. Mm -hmm. So let's make, I wanna make sure we get that out there. So, and I want to also encourage anybody else, you know, if you have an educational institution or academic uh, uh, classes that you have where students need to do research to reach out to, to Roz and to the museum, because they are more than happy to help you guys and to maybe bring some light to a situation that you may not even know about. Because let me tell you, I went and I saw those photos before the they were in the archive. And I'm telling you right now, if it doesn't bring tears to your eyes and it, some, and, and it provoke or evoke some type of emotion out of you, you're probably dead. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, you know, I just want what she's saying is so real and it's so massive. Mm -hmm. And this is before Raj really, I had it all organized. Then I went back another time when she had, they had done some work to it and I couldn't <laughs> believe the amount of work that they had done. When I tell you images beyond images, it's it's uncomprehensible to just the just <laughs> a normal person to believe that this man had the wherewithal to document and 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 and, and store these photos and and negatives in a and way I'll, that somebody could come back and do it when he's not here anymore. Right, that's that mind blowing. Is that is, that is, now that is my book blowing. Because when you go through the files and you see his handwritten subject matter and date on his, on the negatives, it just, it gives us, oh my goodness, it gives us a starting point to begin to know what this is. And, and that's the exciting part. And I think that was a, the, just the photo journal, the journalist in him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to also be able to retrieve that information because he had such a close relationship with the media. Mm -hmm. You know, they always wanted to, to come to him when it came to various uh, subject matters. Now, to let me at least let everybody know the categories that we, we do have so that yes. you can understand the importance of it. His work, his earliest work started in the 40s. And that 40s is in sports. That was his passion when he came from Saipan he went, uh, he came home and he had such a passion for baseball and that passion for baseball led to my parents' entrepreneur spirit to be able to take pictures of the players. So we have the Negro League teams that were there in Memphis and see what was unique about it being in Memphis is that the baseball team also had a stadium in Memphis. Yes. And what is also a gift that Memphis has, and, and it's not really talked about, is that the baseball team, the stadium was owned by African-Americans, the Martin brothers. And wow. that is one of the most unknown. And I don't, I don't even know that that even exists to this day, that wow. an African-American not only owned a team, they owned a stadium. So it was just... Um, so historic that that he recorded all of that and so the early part of the baseball we have the greats you know the the willie mays the jackie robinson the satchel page mm. uh joe campanelli all these guys i you know I, I can't think of all their names at the moment but yeah. he covered that era now wow. Everyone is searching for that because now the stats of the Negro Leagues will now yes. be put into the major leagues and it's going to change some, some numbers and some presence and, yes. and who's stacked one, two, and three. That's yes. going to change. And now they're looking for that. So that's one of the things that we're excited about. Mm -hmm. That sports section is one of the first things that we want to complete in digitizing. And that's the earliest part of his work in the 40s. So then 
we move into another category's work. You know, Memphis is known for what? Of course, we're known for barbecue, but Ooh, music. Yes. <laughs> Memphis is known for music because of Stax. My father was the official photographer for Stax for two decades. Anybody that stepped foot in Stax, I promise you, he has their picture. And most of the time they came to him because if they were doing an album or anything of promotion, they had to have promo photos. So we have studio photos of a lot of people before they became anybody. Uh, we and have Aretha with- Barquez, we have Tina Turner, uh, Aretha Franklin, Sam Cooke, all those guys came through Memphis and they were always you know, around the Stax groups. Of course, the original Stax is Dave Porter, who was the writer. Yes. And then there was Isaac Hayes and and uh, the uh, the MGs. Uh, Booker mm-hmm. T was it Booker T and the MGs? Booker T and the MGs, yes. And yeah, that was the first interracial band that existed. So of mm-hmm. course, we had BB King, we got Ma Rainey. Just uh, it just goes on and on. I mean, wow. we have Duke Ellington who came to Memphis a lot to perform on Bill Street. Yes. Uh, what about Mahalia Louis Jackson? Armstrong, Louis Armstrong, Satchel Paige. I mean, I'm saying what? Satchel Paige. Uh, Louis Armstrong, and there was a that that was his nickname was Satchel something. Louis Armstrong's nickname was Satchel something. But what, what about do you have any Mahalia Jackson? You know what? Yes, I, we have Mahalia Jackson. Uh, you know, she used to have chicken stores. You know these uh, yes uh, restaurants in Memphis. We have yes. Of her- Yes. Listen, yes, I, remember, uh-huh. yes, I remember. I remember going by her, her house uh-huh. and going by the store. I remember going by Isaac Hayes's home. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 what's my guy name? Al Green. Uh huh. You know, and Tons just, of just oh my goodness. Now I just want to make sure that people know when you say stacks. She's talking about stacks records because yes. everyone doesn't know. You know, they mean you know we're from Memphis, so. <laughs> they may not have the history of, you know, since Stax we dating you know, right. ourselves a little bit, we were talking about Stax records. But go ahead. I just wanted to interject that. See. So so then the next uh, category where he was thrusted into, of course, around 1955, starting with the Emmett Till trial. But he covered all of the, the many uh, different events, like uh, when um, James Meredith uh, was Ole Miss. And he was the first uh, college student to get into Ole Miss. And, you know, mm. he was shot. And, but he was doing this march and it was called the March Against Fear. Well, uh, Martin came to continue that march because Meredith had been shot. So we have that whole, that, that the beginning of that all the way, even to, to um, him getting out of the hospital and coming home and his mom's just so happy to see him after he had gotten shot. But fortunately it wasn't really with uh, a gun. It was, uh, it was called a pellet. Uh, uh, it, I think they shoot birds or something with it, yes. but he, he yes. was shot with that as opposed to a gun. So he wasn't injured too bad. But James Meredith is a historical figure that mm-hmm. that uh, really paved the way. He did the Little Rock Nine, uh, their yes. first. And uh, the, um, the funeral of um, uh, Megar Evers. And that was really sad. Um, he was killed on his porch and there's been films about him. Yes. Uh, that have come out. So there are just so many different stories um, that he covered in, the, in that from 1955. Of course, I mentioned the Montgomery bus boycott and many, many others. There are some events that his film was destroyed and the Selma was one of those incidents where we haven't really found some of his film for Selma, but we do know that some of his negatives were destroyed, but we think in his files, there are something related to that Selma event. Okay. Wow, wow. And can you tell me where some of his images are being displayed as of right now, today? Well, I was very happy to be a part of the opening of the African-American Museum of History and Culture. And honestly, we have, our family have to really thank them because we have our family trust that was established that helped us to continue to own my dad's work was through their 
uh, development of creating that museum and, and being interested in, in really purchasing my father's whole estate. And it forced my father to put his affairs in order. And that's the reason why our affairs was in order because of that. The transaction of them purchasing didn't take place. That's another story. We'll talk about that another time. All right, but, okay. Um, but what's interesting is that <clears throat> the relationship continued after the death of my father. And, you know, my mother only lived 10 months after my father passed away. Yes. So I was her successor as the, the trustee. And I was right away faced with the negotiation of their acquisition. So they decided to do a purchase of what they wanted. And they opened with 32 image purchase, but now I think they have up to about 70, but it mm -hmm. was their purchase as well as the purchase from the Library of Congress that took place. They gave our family what we needed to open our own museum because mm -hmm. the city had, had slated my father's last studio, which was a building that was named after him so that we could have the museum and gallery at 333 Bill Street. <laughs> yes, oh my goodness. Wow, you're taking me back now. I'm, I'm totally, <laughs> totally in awe, just knowing I was in the presence and I had an experience and encounter that was so genuine and so real for a man who had so much going for him uh, back in that, in, that, in that time and probably had a lot of things going on that you know, he couldn't share because of how deep he was into the movement and what he was seeing and what he was experiencing. Did you ever get a chance to talk to him about the civil rights movement and how that affected him and, uh, and, and your family as you were going through that and him being a journalist? I don't, I can't say that I had a conversation. I heard many conversations mm -hmm. because, you know, I was, I was the runt in the house. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, but the conversations that were going on in our household, I do remember some of them quite vividly. We had a regular visitor in our home and he was like, he loved my brothers. They always hung out and him and my dad had a beautiful relationship that was with Stokely Carmichael. Every time um, Stokely came into town, he would make sure his foot was at my mother's table because he loved my mother's cooking. <laughs> Yes. And we had a bed or a floor. He wasn't really particularly, he just wanted, you know, somewhere warm to stay. And he would, was always, you know, when he was in Memphis, he would make his way to stay and to eat at our home. So I remember mm -hmm. those many conversations that were going on with him and my father. But I will tell you that the moment that I, I know that my father was very struck was the death of Martin King. Uh, it really moved him greatly. Uh, it impacted him in such a way because, you know, when, when he saw so many things that were taking place that made good changes, that were really uh, accelerating some of the injustices that took place, you know, through the Jim Crow laws, you know, and even though the, the, the laws of Jim Crow was changed, the implementation of that change was very slow, especially in the South. Okay. And uh, they didn't try to rush to change it and, and they just wanted to live, uh, even though it was against the law in, at that point because of what uh, Johnson had signed, you know, that, that law that, that really removed the Jim Crow um, having rights uh, as it did before. Okay. So, um, I forget my my question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just about you know the civil rights movement. Any discussion you and your father oh, might have had. Yeah, and there were just so many things that were going on all the time. Now, my father was not at the the hotel at the assassination because he had just probably 30 minutes prior to that dropped off Andrew Young. Um, Abernathy, mm. uh, who else? It was uh, Jose. Mm. Um, it was several of them had been in court all day because there was a moratorium that prevented any marches to take place because the mayor, Loeb, had stopped 
all marches. He had put this moratorium so that no one could have a march. But he went. They went to court. That was that was uh, reversed. So they were prepared to have a march because Martin was really struck when he was in Memphis a week before, and the march broke out into the riots. And that's what really prompted the I am a man sign because they, those two men were killed during the sanitation strike. I mean, during the sanitation, these two sanitation workers were crushed in um, the back of the truck and they had no provisions for their families. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were, I mean, here, the breadwinner of this, this, these two men and they are killed on the job and yet you can't provide for their families or have some provision when they're working for you. So that's what really started it. But they really wanted something simple like a 10 cent raise, a place to shower because a lot of them when they got off of um, the sanitation routes, they couldn't ride public transportation because they, they, they wouldn't let them shower in the building. The white um, workers had all the facilities that were necessary for them to get clean and then go home. Yes. But that was not allotted to African-American workers. Mm -hmm. So they wanted a place to shower. They wanted shelter from the rain and they wanted a 10 cent raise. That was not a lot to ask for. No, not at all. And that's why they made that sign because they were not treated like men. That's mm -hmm. what brought the birth of I am a man. Treat wow. me like Now that is an image that is forever being seen and ever being published because of the meaning of it. And, you know, our, the city of Memphis has so much history If people really dug deep into that city. There's a lot of pain it is. that's associated with it. But at the same time, there was a lot of birthing and rebirthing that came through the city of Memphis that a lot of people have no clue about. Fortunately for you and I, we were there in the 60s, you know, mm -hmm. just being born, but still we had an experience through our time, throughout school, you know, elementary school, junior high and high school, that mm -hmm. we saw so many things that really cultivated and affected us. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, you know, we were fearful of because we didn't know what the outcomes would be and, and, and for us or our families. Very and true. Speaking mm -hmm. about our families, I, I have two questions for you. I have two questions before I, I'll let you uh, have this day back to yourself. But the one is I want to talk about because your brothers, mm -hmm. I loved your brothers. Well, thank you. Oh my I God! I, yeah, you know, I, I, man, I, you, this woman got a lot of. She got a lot of brothers. <laughs> she I got a lot. Of seven brothers, yes, and I'm the. I was the only girl of of my parents' household. Even though I do have a sister outside, and actually because of her, that's why I'm here. My mom was determined not to have an outside. Yes, going to have me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wow. Five times before I came. Oh. <laughs> she was very damn me. <laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, because your family's yeah. always been involved in the movement. Yes, in yes. Government. One, yeah, my yeah. family, I I had very, very political, very present family. My from, you know, I had a brother that was uh, under the Carter administration, worked a uh, Democrat assistant deputy for the the Democrat committee in DC. And then my brother Teddy was a state legislator. And at one time in my household, there were probably about four people serving some political position yes. in, oh. in our city. So yes. Yeah. yeah. Boy, do I remember those days because they <laughs> would bring so much insight, but they were givers. Yes. They were always in the public side, but they were giving, not yeah. taking away. They were always trying, and they traveled the world. Yes, you know, my trying to find out. Yes, they traveled the world because I, I remember those. I just <laughs> was so in, in, impressed. And yeah. so I'm thinking, wow, I finally I see some black people, some <laughs> black men going out that are in government and, and yeah. they're going out making a difference in the world. I'm like, this 
is so important and was so needed at that point in time. Yeah, and then, Teddy went now, to third countries in Africa wow. and developing a trade center. Yes, he was yes. Very, very, he was truly a visionary and had many, many um, incredible concepts that Memphis embraced, but uh, it was uh, unfortunately not fully fulfilled because of just politics. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and need I say more? You know, you're good. <laughs> That's another conversation and another yeah. time too. But you know that that conversation is definitely needed. And, uh -huh. and but we, we're gonna we're gonna reserve this one for the, what we came in for, and that's about the Withers collection and what you're doing and how it can we can create a, a, add to the legacy and contribute to making the le legacy last. Now I do have a question, that, and I'm not too sure how the two go together. Okay. Which is why I'm asking, which is the Civil Rights Museum, mm -hmm. which is in Memphis. Do you have photos there also? Oh, yes. Oh, I didn't, I just gave you one place, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have pictures in the National Civil Rights Museum as well. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, their existence, their humble beginning was only Ernest Willis photos. That's how they were originating uh, from wow. his images on their walls. And they, of course, expanded far greater mm -hmm. uh, but yes their original beginning was the the works of Ernest Withers mm -hmm. oh, wow that's and awesome. there's still images there yes mm -hmm. yes because they're not far from where your uh gallery no, is they're, they're only um <laughs> two minutes away from us yeah. yeah yeah so when when people go once everything opens up and people get a chance to go to Memphis they, they get can to see both they yes. can hit both and they can yeah. go on Bill Street. They can get some of that good barbecue. Barbecue. <laughs> yeah. And then hopefully if they're going May, they'll get a chance to experience Memphis in May. Oh, now that's an experience. That's woo, music yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. Barbecue extraordinary. Everything about it is wonderful. Yes. Yeah. We didn't get to do it this past year, but nor did the whole world with, with the pandemic. Many things did not take place. Correct. Okay, mm -hmm. Ross. So I want you. If there's anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to share with the audience, including where they can donate again, because they need to be reminded <laughs> to, to invest in us, invest in, in, in our future, invest in their children, understanding the history of what we're doing. Is there anything else that you'd like to share today? Well, just that we also have, we talked about the categories, the civil rights, the music, the baseball, and then there's just lifestyle. The lifestyle mm -hmm. images cover our history of all everyday life uh, from um, uh, debutante balls to weddings, to funerals, everything you can imagine that everyday life, every event that took place across the, you know, the, the Mid-South, mm -hmm. Ernest Withers was there. The only time I could tell you that he probably wasn't there. And I think I had this conversation with you the other day. And I have to thank my mother for that is the staple Saturday breakfast we would always have that my father yeah. seemed to have always been there. <laughs> but if it was on Saturday morning, he probably didn't cover it. But any day, Monday through, through Sunday, including Saturday afternoon, he was there on the spot. But he, he, we, we had a big breakfast on Saturday morning. That's why it was not a void for him as being a part of my life because my mother put that into our day to you know week to week activity and and it meant so much and of course I didn't realize how much it meant back then yes but it was really uh very special because people always ask me your dad was everywhere was he ever home yeah he was there <laughs> he, like he was always home but yes. I'm like when did you do this you know? <laughs> So it was because my mom knew that it was important for him to be in our lives. And he had a special time that we were always together. And that mm. was those Saturdays. Wow. And Ross, finally, uh, tell us whether we can donate again to yes. the museum. You can go to our website at thewitherscollection.com. And as soon as you go on the site, at the top right, there's a button that says donate. It's a very easy process. And you can also enjoy the website because you can purchase images, the work and books. We have a, a new book that, was, that came out uh, a year, two, 
November last year, no, okay. year before. Mm -hmm. And uh, that book has 80%, no, 60% of that book is never seen before images. So it has been, it has actually received some awards. So we were excited wow. about that too. I don't have the official award, but it did receive awards of, of its, uh, in the category in which it was uh, in. So, okay, very special historic. So go to our website and share the work. And we really would like this image. If you don't want to donate, you can always purchase something because that yes. also goes toward our work. And we would love for this history to be in each and every one of our households. And you remember when you were growing up, how you would see Martin, Kennedy, and who else? It was three of them. It was oh, Martin wow. and Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> they were always there. <laughs> always. <laughs> always yeah. in the house, right? That's so, true. so I'm saying make an earnest where there's a part of an image in your home so that you can educate your, your family on our history. Yes. Well, Roz, <laughs> pleasure. I want to thank you for taking time out to come on, share with the audience. And so just so I won't forget, not that I'm putting you on the spot on the air, but I just want to remind myself to remind you to make sure you send me some images so I can put on the yes. clip and put on, I put, I put them on my website as well. No, just, just reach out to Connor. Connor has, okay. he can flip it to you so quick. I'll, okay, I'd good. have to figure out where to go. <laughs> okay, got you, got you. You got well, the contact, just say yes. Connor. Just need to do that. And and that's how simple it is for you to get it. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you so much, Roz. I love you with all my heart. Oh, absolutely. Bless you. Many love blessings you guys to too. you. Miss you guys. Come yes. home. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to come back and visit one day really yes. soon. We're going to sneak up absolutely. on your surprise. Oh, that would be uh, awesome. I can't wait. <laughs> all right. Hold on.